He's double booked. There you go. Uh, good evening. Uh, we'll call to order the uh, Board of Selectmen's meeting for Tuesday, November 3rd, 2015. All selectmen are present except for Chairman Rooney, who is traveling out of town. Uh, I'd like to start the meeting today uh, to take a minute to remember Patrice Klein, who passed away on Saturday, uh, October 24th. She was a 26-year member of uh, the town's uh, employee with the assessor's department, including a stint as the president of the SEIU Clerical Union. Um, she was well-liked and served uh, residents, employees, and her customers uh, well. Um, and along with my uh, fellow board members and the rest of the town, I'd like to offer our condolences uh, to her family, especially her children, Penelope and Ethan. And I'd ask you to join me now in a moment of silence for Patrice. Thank you very much. First item, 6.30 p.m., tax classification hearing. Uh, Mr. Purple, do you have anything, or shall I just uh, throw it over to Mr. Sibeli? No, I think you could throw it over to, uh, to Mr. Sibeli. This is our annual uh, tax classification hearing, um, and uh, Mr. Sibeli is our principal assessor. We do also have two members of the Board of Assessors here with him, and uh, joining Paul at the table this evening is Brian Ballantyne, the finance director, so I think Paul can take it from here. All righty, so we have Tom Beaumont, our chairman, with us and uh, Jeffrey Klein. Uh, Arthur was here earlier. Uh, Arthur's double booked. He's got a meeting over in Framingham. He's a member of the Board of Assessors in Framingham and uh, Northboro. Is this on? We're good. Yes, you're good. All righty, so here we are with our annual classification uh, hearing, and what I will do is read a uh, letter in um, from the board um, and their recommendation. And then I'll go over a few facts and figures. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll turn it back over to you um, for discussion amongst the board and uh, comment from the public. And then hopefully we'll have a vote tonight. And if that be the case, we'll file the paperwork tomorrow morning and have a tax rate set. Um, we, are, uh, we were in a certification year just to let you know. Every three years we go through an audit from the Department of Revenue. Um, and we finished about three and a half to four weeks earlier than we ever have. Um, so we're uh, ahead of schedule for a classification hearing during a certification year, which is good news. Um, so I'm going to just start reading the uh, letter here. It's dated November 3rd, 2015, to the Board of Selectmen and Citizens of Southboro. The Board of Assessors is pleased to present information and options for the Board of Selectmen to determine whether there shall be a single tax rate or split tax rate for various classes of property for fiscal year 2016. Tax classification allows communities to have different rates for certain classes of property and allows the Board of Selectmen to make the decision whether or not to shift the tax burden from one class of property to another. State statute uh, provides a maximum allowable portion of the tax levy up to 150% to be borne by the commercial, industrial, and personal property classes, better known as CIP in a minimum allowable portion to be borne by the residential class. For FY16, the total taxable value of the town of Southboro increased by 96.68 million to 2.342 billion. The assessors calculated 43.962 million in new growth value uh, within the town, which equates to $704,263 in new tax dollars. Uh, this is down from the previous year of 933, uh, 141, and 15. Uh, it's still an excellent year for us. Uh, Southboro's average single family home valuation increased from 557,300 to 575,500 in 2016, a 3.2% uh, increase. Should the Board of Selectmen decide to continue with a single tax rate, the FY16 rate would decrease from 1602 per thousand to 1582 per thousand. The average single family tax bill would increase from $8,928 in 15 to 9104 in 16. It's a $176 increase 
uh, which is about a 1.97% increase. And that's excluding our friend, the Community Preservation Act surcharge. The Board of Assessors have attached several split rate options at the end of this classification packet for the Board of Selectmen to review. The chart depicts various split rate shifts, the tax rate impact, as well as the effect on the average single family tax bill. Also attached is a list of the 16 surrounding communities, which reveals five having a split tax rate. The Board of Assessors unanimously recommends that the town of Southbrook continue with a single tax rate. We believe a single tax rate helps a small town like uh, Southboro attract new businesses into the community while retaining those already located in town. Expanding businesses within the community provides new tax dollars with little impact on costly town services. A major factor in the Board of Assessors recommendation is the amount of the town's value that is derived from commercial, industrial, and personal property classes which accounts for 19.22% of the South Bros total value. With a relatively small percentage of value coming from these classes, a split tax rate would only produce a small savings to the residential class while causing a large increase to the CIP classes, thus making South Bro a less attractive place to conduct business. It is important to note that of the town's 3,704 taxable parcels, 220 of them are commercial industrial properties. Commercial and industrial properties therefore represent 5.94% of the taxable parcels in Southboro, but account for 19.22% of the total tax revenue. This figure includes personal property taxes, which many businesses pay in addition to their real estate taxes. This data suggests commercial and industrial classes pay their fair share of taxes under a single tax rate. The Board of Assessors also recognizes the, uh, the role businesses play in contributing additional funds to support many of the town's athletic, recreational, and community events. Respectfully, the Southboro Board of Assessors, Thomas J. Beaumont Chairman, Arthur K. Holmes, Jeffrey W. Klein. Just gonna flip through a few of the uh, facts and figures here. Uh, the first one here uh, is the average single family assessment. Again, you can see it rising from 557,300 to 575,500. Uh, uh, as a result, the tax rate again is, we're looking if you stick with a single rate, would go from 1602 to 1582. And if you look below on the chart, it just gives you uh, what we said in the letter. Uh, the tax, uh, again, average tax bill in 2015 was 8,928. Uh, would be going up to $9,104. Again, it's a small increase, 1.97%. Uh, I do want to remind taxpayers and the board, the FY16 assessments reflect value as of January 1st, 2015, utilizing 2014 sales. So the 15 sales market conditions will not be, um, will not be reflected till next year or fiscal year 17's assessment. So if a taxpayer opens up their bill this January 1st, 2016, you'll see the new tax rate and you'll see the new assessment. Keep in mind that assessment as soon as you open your tax bill is already one year old as the assessment process is time lagged throughout the Commonwealth um, by one year. That's not a South Bro thing, that's across the Commonwealth. The next page, the assessment values by class and that just summarizes um, your residential, your commercial, and your industrial, your personal property. And again, you see that the value of the town total value is $2,341,000,000. Um, this is a new high for the town. Uh, this exceeded the high setback in fiscal year 2008 um, by $75.4 million. Uh, so it goes to show you with the market dip um, that occurred um, both on the residential and commercial side, it, it took quite a while for us to exceed that uh, fiscal year 08 total value. Uh, the relationship of classes, again, you can see the commercial, uh, it's 19.22%, the residential is 80.78% of the total uh, value. Um, and you can see it's pretty much, historically, the CIP remains between 18 and 20%. It's pretty much around 19%. Uh, there's been very little fluctuation over the years. Uh, going to the next uh, page, uh, I know uh, people are always asking, well, what are the tax rates in the surrounding communities? <clears throat> I just remind you, uh, that's not a mistake at the top, the 2015 tax rates. Uh, I looked this morning, out of 353 tax rates that are set across the Commonwealth, 
uh, less than 50 have been set. So obviously we want to look at the 15 rates, compare our 15 rate, and then show you what the 16 rate is. Um, and again, you see the, uh, there's a few with a split rate there as well. <clears throat> uh, if you look at the very bottom, you can see in red um, the mass communities with a single rate, 241 out of 351, 68.7%. Uh, and that's the same as the previous two years. That uh, figure um, has not changed. So you can see it's overwhelmingly um, single rates. Uh, most communities in Massachusetts are single rates. The next page we have is uh, fiscal year uh, tax rate options. Um, the top box is the fiscal year 15 rate and average tax bill. Um, again, if we stick with a... Um, Single rate, you can see it there in the next box down, options for fiscal year 2016 tax rates at 1582 with the tax, taxes of uh, 9,104 as the average tax bill. Um, and I've given you scenarios of 5, 10, 15, 20, and 25% and what the savings would be there. Um, and that's, that's about it, Mr. Chairman. Back to you. Uh, questions for Mr. Sibeli or his board, Mr. Kalinda? Uh, well done. Thank you. Once again, uh, great presentation. Thank you for that. Also, uh, you know, thanks to uh, the board for the uh, wonderful work they continue to do. Um, the analysis is, uh, you know, it, um, is very much appreciated, and your guidance and your, uh, you know, unanimous decision or recommendation, um, I think, carries significant weight for me. Um, you know, every year I continue to, you know, uh, hear from businesses about. Um, you know, they, you know, there, there are pressures on them consistently on, uh, you know, maintaining their own profit and viability. Um, I also, uh, you know, in, in hearing from them this year has been no different. Um, the, um, uh, I've also done uh, my own bit of research out there of, uh, of some towns that have a, a split rate. Um, there are a couple in particular that if you do do some analysis and some research, you'll see that they are looking to walk back from those split rates. And in particular, I recall reading quite a bit about um, Worcester and Framingham and uh, their efforts to try to walk that back. So, um, you know, that, uh, you know, they've already done it um, by going to that rate and now they've seen that hey, they, they're trying to get back to a single rate, so or very close to it. Um, uh, uh, so again, thank you for, for, uh, the analysis. I think it's, uh, uh, it, you know, is consistent with my own review and, and as I've done in years past, I look to fully support the single tax rate. This is Faniff. Again, thank you for the presentation on new growth. Uh, Mr. Savelli, it's, it's down considerably. I, and if the, for the public to understand, and they see development going on in Southboro, whether it be a large condo complex or housing, how is that number calculated into this spreadsheet? One of the things is you did mention that it went down significantly. Um, let me just say that I think our estimate was probably 450,000. One of the things with that is it's really timing on when projects wrap up. And uh, you know, you had made a good point last year. We had so much, and a lot of that was exactly due to the apartment complex being, uh, being uh, completed um, up off of Crystal Pond. Um, so that had a significant impact on, uh, on the amount of growth. And we, if, if you remember when we had talked that I was expecting a, a pretty decent lull this year, and again, we were thinking maybe 450 to $500,000. And again, it's really the timing of projects when they hit as you well know, we have a couple other 40B projects out there, um, and those have actually been kind of delayed. Uh, they're not all the way through hearings yet. Um, so again, we were expecting it to dip. Why did it actually, although it's lower, why is it higher than our expectation? Really, that had to do with personal property. We had some very large increases in new growth on telecommunications um, and some of the utility companies, uh, which really Personal property is very, very difficult to um, estimate uh, what the new growth is going to be because unlike 
real estate. You know what projects are coming down. You know what's in the pipeline. Uh, we don't really know until we receive the form of lists. Form of lists aren't due back until the beginning of uh, March. So we don't really, we're not really able to gauge. Um, you really have to be conservative when you're estimating new growth. But really, it was the new growth derived from personal property um, that really bumped us above what we thought the uh, estimate is. And to answer your question, it's nothing more than just the timing of various projects. We do have some good projects, as you well know, uh, in the pipeline. It's just a matter of getting them through the boards and committees. <clears throat> and the reason I ask that question, because I think it's important to recognize that we have to have a balance of development in this town to sustain a realistic bottom line as far as revenue stream. We can't depend on new houses, condos, apartments, because those are one-time uh, gains. So a balance is really important. They're also the ones that utilize, as was mentioned in the letter, as, you know, they're the ones that use all the town services. Your businesses, uh, they're the biggest money maker for the community. And I, I, I do want to, there is one thing that I did want to bring up is when you have a great deal of, um, of your new growth coming from personal property, it's not sustainable value. Uh, you put up a building, you estimated it $10 million. Over time, it's going to, you know, usually raises in value. Personal property depreciates, especially on telecommunication properties, uh, utilities. Um, technology changes so quickly. So I just wanted to kind of give you a quick figure just to drive that home. Is I believe if you look in the, the personal property value that we had in fiscal year 15, we, the value, overall value of personal property was 84 point. Uh, for a uh, million dollars, okay? And you can see in, in personal property uh, in fiscal year 16 is only 87,775,000 for your total value. Now we had $23 million of new growth in personal property. So you can see how it depreciates. And what, it, what that does is it can expand your cap rate significantly because you're capturing that new growth, but the value drop off um, you know, doesn't really help you a whole heck of a lot with, uh, with your tax rate. <clears throat> uh, so I do want to make that clear. It's, it's, we would love to see our new growth on the commercial, industrial, personal property in buildings and not in uh, personal property. Thank you. Mr. Shea. So I know that uh, I think part of it was done this past summer was the uh, revaluation of, the pers of residences. The visits to homes, and I'm just curious how that all ties in with the valuation. Yeah, Brian, be careful on that because some people get a little confused. We revalue every single year, so there's no difference in what we do. What we are doing is updating our data. So the Department of Revenue requires you to have a measure and list program. Every nine years, you have to go through all your real estate, uh, remeasure it, list it, try to get inside. Um, we do it by class. Uh, you know, commercial, industrial, then we'll go to condos, um, mixed use, uh, multifamily. The biggest, biggest project we do is, resident, is uh, single families because obviously that's the most of our properties are. So over the last two and a half years, that's what we've been working on. Um, and it's really updating uh, the data, which obviously drives into value. But I just want to make sure people understand we value every year. People are under the assumption, oh, you know, we don't let them in, you know, they can't value our house properly. That's not really true. We're going to revalue your house one way or another. Um, you obviously want accurate data. Accurate data, we're analyzing sales, so you want to make sure that you're building uh, a valuation model on sales that have accurate data. Um, as many houses, now we went in a lot of houses. Um, some people take care of the houses and, and increase their value because of maybe, um, um, you know, kept the values, uh, kept the uh, improvement up. Uh, but we went into a lot of houses where we, you know, we get out there and find out the pool was, you know, removed three years ago and nobody notified us. Um, perhaps their basement flooded and they tore their basement finish out. We had to remove that. The condition of their properties were reduced. Um, so really it's a reflection of, you know, what the current conditions are of the property. And again, we only go through it every nine years and it is something the Department of Revenue requires all communities throughout the Commonwealth to have in place, and that's a measure and list program. <clears throat> Hopefully I answered your question oh, without okay. getting... Uh, thank you for the clarification uh, on that as well. And we, we I do want to thank, uh, I, I want to thank the property owners. We did fairly well. Typically what happens is they tell you uh, when you hire out a company that you, you know, you'll get in about a third of the properties. 
I think we were pretty close to 40, 42% uh, of interior inspections. So I really appreciate everybody's uh, um, cooperation. Um, I am going to go out to uh, the public here, but a couple of things first. One is I want to acknowledge a letter uh, written uh, last week uh, by Corridor 9 Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I won't read it into the record, um, but it is uh, it's firmly uh, in support of a single rate, and I, I believe uh, Ms. Chapman is here if she wants to get up in a, in a, in a little bit. Um, not yet. Um, it's 6.50. Uh, this is the time we have posted for a hearing with regard to ins installation of underground utilities. Is there somebody here from National Grid? Uh, Ma'am, uh, would you be amenable to uh, hanging tight with us till we get through this item, and then we'll, we'll convene your hearing uh, immediately after that. Thank you very much for that. Um, okay, so I will go out uh, to the public. I will say, though, uh, for myself, uh, so I'm not accused of uh, sticking my thumb in the wind, I, I am also firmly in favor of a single rate. Uh, but I'm uh, obviously willing to uh, hear from whomever would like to take the mic at this point. Uh, Mr. Stivers, you, um, you came up to the table, so uh, if you're still inclined, let's start with you. Still inclined, thank you. Um, clearly, the board has already voted on this. Uh, I'm Sam Stivers, 7 Presidential Drive, uh, South Borough. I'm a member of the advisory committee, but I'm speaking as a private citizen about this. Um, for those of you who haven't been here for these previously, this is my annual pitch, I guess, to the uh, Board of Selectmen. But uh, um, I guess to cut to the chase, I think I would urge the Selectmen to vote for a 105 percent approach as described by the Assessor's Office to increase the um, uh, CIP rate to about 5 percent, a little more than 5 percent over the, the residential rate. I think that you do this for a variety of reasons. One, I think it's good public policy to give a break to the 3,500 residential taxpayers out there at the expense of the 220 or thereabouts business taxpayers. Uh, the business taxpayers actually have the opportunity to pass some of that cost increase along to their customers, which we as residents don't have, as a matter of fact. Um, I think it's important to note that the only data that we have about the results of such an approach shows that it actually is not a problem. Um, I'm struck by the fact, I've been attending these hearings for 15 years roughly, and um, I'm struck by the fact that I have yet to see a single piece of data provided by the assessor, by the selectman, or anybody else that demonstrates that it's a problem to go to a split rate. As a matter of fact, the argument seemed to boil down to two things for the, for the single rate. One is that businesses don't want to pay more taxes. That's hardly big news. Residents don't want to pay more taxes either, as a matter of fact. The other argument is that the split rate will discourage business activity. I think the first one, again, no surprise. The second one, again, has no basis in actual data. Um, if you look at the data that, uh, in fact, Carl Geyer, who many of you have seen make presentations about the split tax rate, I think has a lot of data that demonstrates there are about a third of the towns in Massachusetts that have a split rate. Uh, no disaster has occurred in any of those towns that has been evident to anybody. In fact, uh, the Economic Development Committee group, which I attend pretty regularly, I've heard on more than one occasion, uh, Mr. McKay, Mr. Pizzoni, and others point out Marlborough as an example of a town that does a great job in terms of attractive and attracting and retaining businesses. Marlborough has a split rate. Their CIP rate is nearly twice as much as the residential rate in terms of dollars per thousand. They seem to do pretty well with it. The issue for me, again, is that it's an interesting topic that's worth trying because it gives a break to the residential taxpayers. I think another reason to give it a try is that if we do get to a point at some point in the future where this is an important thing fiscally to do, I'd feel a lot more comfortable if I were sitting in the selectman's chair to know that the assessor's office has the infrastructure to be able to implement this. Usually with any new program, there are challenges and difficulties in terms of implementation. I'd like to know it works in terms of the infrastructure that's required to do it. I think this, with a 105 percent approach, is a relatively painless way to do it. Demonstrates the concept it can be done, and if we need to do it later at some point in the future, or if we need to back off of it if it generates unexpected consequences that are problematic, uh, we can easily back off of it. But I'd feel better knowing we can do it. I'd also think that it makes sense, again, to give the uh, uh, like 15 times, 15 to 1 ratio of businesses to more than that even, of businesses or residents to businesses. Uh, you want to, I think, do something that's uh, uh, helpful to 3,500 people as opposed to the 220 people here who don't have to bear the full burden of that. So 
that would be my uh, recommendation to you. Clearly, from your comments, uh, everybody's made up their minds in terms of how they're going to vote. But uh, I would hope that you would uh, remain an open mind on it and look at the data. Data is pretty clear. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stivers. Yes, Mrs. Fan. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Stivers, for your com uh, commentary. However, if I compare Southboro to Marlboro, there's a two, to two cent difference in the tax rate. And I believe Marlboro has considerable vacancies, and they also have more retail than the town of Southboro. And I personally do not want to model myself after Marlboro. Okay. The data that the uh, assessor provided in the report in your package tonight says that Marlboro, the residential rate is $15.76, and the commercial rate is $27.43, which is nearly twice as much. Southboro's residential rate will be $15.82. I'm, I'm comparing the commercial to the residential. That's the concept of the split tax rate. I understand that, but I don't want to compare myself to Marlboro either. Well, I'm just saying that the EDC folks think, seem to think Marlboro is doing a great job of attracting and retaining business. So clearly Maybe this we'll is hear from a them next. That's a good segue, Mr. McKay. Hi, good evening. I'm Dave McKay. I'm chair of the Economic Development Committee. Uh, I'm at 61 Presidential Drive. I want to emphasize that I'm speaking on my own behalf and not on behalf of the entire committee. Um, we've had this debate uh, ongoing for at least as long as I've been in Southboro, and I know for uh, quite a while longer than that. But I just want to emphasize just a couple of things quickly. The first is the question of fairness. Um, what we're, you know, when, when this concept of a split rate comes up, what you're essentially asking the, the, the business community to do is to shoulder a larger share of the tax burden uh, than they already do. And all of the data, and, and I think Mr. Sibeli referred to this, uh, a short while ago shows that the, the business community already isn't using um, in services from the town what it, what it pays in taxes. So to exaggerate that and make the balance uh, even greater than it already is, just I, I don't see the equities in that and I don't understand um, how you can you know, really justify that other than the just sort of natural inclination that any resident would want that if they can have their tax rate or their tax bill lower and make somebody else pay the bill for it, that, uh, that they'd prefer to do that. But I don't think that's really uh, in, in fairness to our partners in the business community who do a lot to help our town out. Second point is it doesn't work. It just doesn't work, a split rate. If you look at, and I'll just, we, we could go on uh, on the data for quite a long time, but I'll just point out two things on that. First, if you look at the um, spreadsheet that the Board of Assessors put together with the surrounding communities, um, and you look at the tax rates, and I think you have to be careful about reading too much into the tax rate, because the tax rate is influenced by other things. But if you use that as a, a little bit of a litmus test, and you look at the one, two, five communities that have a split tax rate um, in our neck of the woods, you'll find that it, 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 it doesn't save the residents um, from, uh, it doesn't provide a huge discount on the residential tax rate. And that, in fact, what you see is Southboro's single tax rate is lower than most of the towns that have a dual tax rate. So again, there is no free lunch out there. The third point is that this really undermines the partnership that the selectmen through their leadership and the Economic Development Committee and others have really been trying to build with our business community. We're not trying to, we're, we're trying to avoid and get away from an us versus them mentality and really welcome our businesses and our business community into the fabric of our town. And that requires a partnership between town government, the residents and the business community, and we see that happening all the time. They sponsor our sports teams. They, they uh, uh, do all kinds of great things for our town in addition to the tax revenue that they provide. And I think maintaining a split tax rate to make sure that we do what we can to preserve um, their competitive, competitiveness in the regional marketplace is really important. One other thing, since the issue of Marlboro was brought up, I just want to mention that uh, briefly. Marlboro has twice the commercial vacancies that we do here in Southboro. They've had, and, and I serve on 
uh, uh, in, in, in the city of Marlboro too. I was chair of their chamber last year, and I also work with their economic uh, development corporation. But again, you know, there's no silver bullet. What Marlboro has been able to do in attracting new businesses to the city of Marlboro has been great. But one of the things that they've had to do in order to make that a reality is to grant a lot of TIFs. So you're paying for it on one side or the other. And in all these towns where you have the split tax rate, that's what ends up happening. They're either trying to walk away from it or they're trying to compensate for the split tax rate through um, giving TIFs to, to businesses to either locate there or expand there. So um, I appreciate the leadership that the selectmen have shown on this issue, uh, particularly in recent years, uh, as well as the Board of Assessors. And I would uh, strongly urge the selectmen to keep the single tax rate that we have in Southboro. And I thank, the again, the assessors and the selectmen for all the great work that they've done on this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Robbins, yes. I'm Chris Robbins. I serve on the Economic Development Committee, and I live on 39 Parkerville Road. First of all, I want to thank the Board of Selectmen and all your predecessors for all the years that the option of selecting from a single tax rate to a dual tax rate this board, with the exception of one year, and that vote was reversed quickly, has voted consistently for a single tax rate. Mr. Geyer and Mr. Stivers keep referring to their data. Neither one of them are economists, and this information that both Mr. Geyer and Mr. Stivers submitted to one of the, one of the state's top economists has refuted the data that they have put together. So. When we talk about data, one of the best pieces, so that's one piece of this response to this proposition. The second one is the overwhelming piece of data is the wisdom and the, and the uh, intellect of the two-thirds of the towns and cities that have consistently voted for the single tax rate. Common sense, good intellectual power, and great leadership has assured that this rate is appropriate for our town and two-thirds of the other towns and cities. The other thing I wanted to mention, when we talk about the businesses community, I find it sad, regretful, that Mr. Geyer and Mr. Stivers would talk about the business communities as if there were a blank wall. More than 50% of all the businesses in our community are small businesses owned by families who live here. And we would be putting on an additional tax on what they're already paying to deliver services to their residents and or businesses. So it's a punitive tax. I also want to recall Mr. Stiver's comment a year and a half ago, and he said, let's try an experiment and see how this works. I don't believe in experimenting with the personal lives of the leaders who have founded their businesses. I don't believe. <laughs> And let's just take EMC, who everybody treats as big pockets. He started out of a garage. Um, most of the businesses start small, like Ted's of Fayville, started in 1962. We're not going to penalize them and in addition to all the hard work they have done. They have contributed enormously to this town, and they are not inanimate objects, as Mr. Stivers has implied. Um, and I want to congratulate the assessor's office because what you're helping us to do, and this is new for the town of Southboro, we're reframing how we think of our towns. We are not tax collection and tax disbursement agencies. We are a local economy, a thriving center of commerce with 630 businesses, 19 industry sectors, 20 nonprofits that are the biggest employers, 20 firms that are international businesses that do business all over the globe. Ladies and gentlemen, we are a center of commerce, and the way you have been uh, proposing to go forward with this single tax rate only supports our ability to compete in today's marketplace. So I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Robbins. Uh, sir, yes, anything we haven't already heard? Uh, thank you for your time and good evening. Uh, my name is Bob McDonald, representing EMC Corporation, uh, the big guy in the block. Um, we want to thank uh, the board for allowing us time to speak before you. 
I want to thank the assessors who we've worked with over the years. And we want to uh, just let you know that I uh, would like you to vote for the single tax rate. All the other uh, jurisdictions that we operate in Metro West have a single tax rate. And uh, we'd like to see it continue here in uh, Southborough. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. And while she comes up, just to thank you to EMC and our other corporations, they do an incredible amount of um, uh, charitable contribute, contributions to, uh, to our communities. And, and sir, if you'd thank them on the behalf of the town as well. Good evening, Selectman, and um, also Mrs. Sabelli. I'm Karen Chapman, I'm the president of the Corning 9 Chamber of Commerce, and we've been at the, the podium in the microphone before in support of single tax classification. There's a lot of what has been said that obviously I support those remarks on behalf of Dave McKay and Chris Robbins and obviously our great business partner of EMC. Um, most importantly, one of the things that was talked about earlier is that the uh, resource that the business community has done to support um, our local um, education, which is something that we should talk about. Um, the Chamber of Commerce has a strong school business partnership program and through that school business partnership program all the donations and all the mini grants that we support for educators and all the donations of equipment and technology comes from the business community. So we believe that um, and support single tax classification is because the business community is here to support um, not only with a fair tax rate but to help their community um, be successful and on top of that as we try to attract new business to this particular region we also know that single tax classification helps attract people into our region with the fine school systems that we have so everything has been well said prior to me and I just want to come up here formally and um, echo everybody's remarks about supporting a single tax classification thank you thank you anybody else who hasn't spoken yet um, I think, uh, Mr. Stivers, I think your points are well taken, but I do, um, for myself, I do um, agree with Mrs. Faniff's concept of a balance here and what we need going forward in town. And I will say, um, because it's been repeated a lot, I don't agree with the sort of easy mantra that so many other towns do this, because there will be times when that won't work for Southboro. Um, it, I think it does in this case, but not always, so I, I caution uh, against that. But th those are my personal comments at this point I'll entertain a motion uh, I would move that the uh, this board uh, continue as we have done and and with the a strong recommendation of the um, of our assessor and the board of assessors uh, that we retain a single tax rate second for the discussion from the board all in favor aye, aye. aye. Four zero. Thank you all very much, Mr. Sibeli and your board. We will take a one minute recess while we sign off on this. <clears throat>
Okay, we're back on um, 650 uh, with the indulgence of uh, the nice uh, lady we're about to meet. We are going to now take up the Mass Electric Company National Grid Installation of Underground uh, Facilities uh, hearing. Ma'am, would you uh, come forward, identify yourself? Good evening, my name is Crystal Tugnazi. I'm from National Grid in Hopedale, Mass. So National Grid um, has an infrastructure work request for Stonebrook Village in Southboro. That's a new 15 um, building development to be going on Oregon Road. And National Grid is proposing to run approximately 20 feet of primary cable underground from existing pole six to feed Stonebrook Court. Um, typically, we install a riser pole on the side of the development. However, the order of conditions prevented us from doing that. Um, so that is why we are running existing, um, running from an existing pole location or proposing to. The developer is going to be installing the two to three inch conduits from the existing pole six across the way to feed up Stonebrook Court. And that's... All I have. And you said how long, but I didn't catch it. How long is the run? Approxim it's approximately 25 feet from pole six to, um, from curb to curb. That's what would be running on public way. Pole six, I'm sorry, pole six is right in front of 30, on, number 30, on. Oregon. We'll, oh, okay. We'll, we will take comment from the from the audience. Let's go down. Let's start uh, down here with Mr. Shea. Anything before we go is out the, to the uh, What is the schedule to get this done? Do you anticipate this fall, or would it be next spring after the um, winter? Typically what happens is once we get through petition, if payment hasn't been made by the developer, payment has to be made. Then it's usually a two- to four-week process for scheduling, um, depending on how quickly the development is moving along. So if they're ready for transformers, if they've installed their conduit on their end, if they've done their pad mounts, that's really what hinders the scheduling for us to do our work. Okay. So I guess the concern I have is if it's done prior to the winter and then maintaining that trench across the roadway through the winter. So if it could hold off till the spring, get through the winter, I guess that six would is be... Where? Excuse me, sir. Is that in front of my property? Is that third, at third. six on um, no, 30. Hey, let's, um, 30? excuse me, sir, sir, we're going to go through the chair. You'll be able to, uh, ask any questions you want and talk as long as you need. Please give us a minute. I'm here for a reason. Uh, you, you're going to, you're not going to dig up the road in front of my house. Sir, I'm going to recognize you when the time you comes. Dig up the road. I get flooded because you never fix it. Right. I want to hear all of it when the time comes. Oh, you're going to hear minute. it. All right. All right. Oh, you're going to hear it from my attorneys. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. The next time water comes down that road, uncontrolled into my property, you guys are going to have a major problem. Uh, it, it sounds you fine You already to me. have. Okay. Mr. Black, we're trying to hear Hawaii. the information first. Hawaii. Okay. No. I just hear all of the information They first. send us these things. Hey. These are yes. really nonchalant. But then when we say I'll move uh, then we go into a recess. All, the answers. all right. We'll Second. be recessed at uh, 714. All questions. You guys
Okay, we're back on. Um, Mr. Shea, you had the floor. Are you? Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, let's pick it back. So up. I guess the concern I had was just maintenance of that trench over the uh, the winter with plowing, um, settlement of, of the trench, etc. Yes. Damaging of town equipment, the sanders and the plows going over that stretch. Right. Mrs. Faniff. I think Mr. Shea asked all the questions that needs to be asked, but it'd be nice if we could turn down the fans so people can hear us, if at all possible. Um, I, I'm not the engineer for this job. However, it seems as though some of, uh, there are some questions about the actual location of this. I was provided 30 Oregon Road. However, it seems as though 14 is on the same side, um, up, up on the opposite side of the pole in which we are requesting to dig from. Um, so that being said, I may want to bring this back to the mm -hmm. engineer. <laughs> just it's okay. I, I was I heading just, that way myself. So I can provide better information too if there's any further questions. Yes. So are are you uh, are you withdrawing this item for tonight? I would withdraw this. I would like to ask to withdraw this. Any objection from the board? No. no. Linda, go ahead. No, thank you. Uh, no objections. Uh, but when you do, you know, please uh, ask the engineers to, as best they can, always work with any of the residents um, in that area that may be affected in anticipation of any issues that may come up, how they would be addressed and mitigated, and then we'll have that ready as part of any response that you may have next time you come. Okay. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. We still have residents that have questions. Well, I think at this point, Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Mimi. Come on up. Uh, Mimi Latrell, 19 Oregon Road. I understand that it's been withdrawn, but just for future question, this project is under appeal. So if um, they lose on appeal, are they going to dig the road back up again and put it back, or what happens? No, well, it's a fair question. We'll have DPW here next time we're here, too. That's not the position. That's the position. Um, okay. okay. Uh, we'll have have, so, so, in order to answer that question, we, I, I don't think we can, ahead. but yeah. is Mr. Purple correct? It's the developer's issue that would have to correct that? It is, okay. it is the develop, it would be the developer's issue at that point, yes. Let, let me ask one question, ma'am. If and when this, this line gets, the, the road gets dug, the line gets laid down, et cetera, how long does that actually take to have the road open? We coordinate all of the work. So what would happen is the developer would dig the trench and then we would lay the wire. Mm -hmm. um, however, as soon as they get, I don't know if it's a municipal inspection, typically with us, we have to have a trench inspector that comes out for private. So you know, if they have the, the private road to the development. Um, we would have an inspector that comes out for our company. However, this is on a public way, so I, I don't know if does the DPW come out Normal, and inspect the trench. Normally, there'll be someone that? from Public Works inspecting the trench as well. Okay, so yeah. usually we do that same day. I would assume the DP, DPW would also do that same day, where they dig it up, they lay their conduit, they get inspected, they close it up. All right. So we need a little more information about how it's going to be done. But <clears throat> if it's done, assuming it's done properly, if it is done, and the and the um, the appeal is successful, then the developer has dug a trench to nowhere. I'm not sure that's an issue. It's, you know, it'll just never get hooked up to anything. There is a response. The issue could be a drainage issue. I think that's one of the things that's I may have heard. done properly. Yeah. So, in, to ensure it's done, is, is will our do we have staff that would ensure that? Yes. The DPW and that will yeah. be signed off on. And if there is issues, then it's the town's responsibility to correct those at town cost. Right, that's correct. The town is the town ensures that it's installed properly when it's in the public roadway. All right, thank you, Mr. Purple. So at the next hearing, I suggest we have uh, DPW superintendent yes. here to answer those questions. I do have to add that when National Grid does any kind of trenching or anything along the public way, we are responsible to re maintain and also restore any equipment or any kind of facilities that are in the area, such as sidewalks, berms, curbs. Anything that needs to be um, brought back to its original condition. If we do not, we are responsible. Yeah, my point is, town council will correct me, but I think it's the, it's the develop. To your question, maybe it's the developer's risk on that at that point. You know, if he's building, if he's continuing to, you know, 
work during the appeal, during the pendency of the appeal. All right, I'm going to come back to public comment. I want to do uh, Mr. Purple's report first. Is that all right with you, Mr. Purple? Um, you can do public comment at first if you'd like. It's no, I'll however let you you'd to like go. to do it. Um, Let's take your report. Sure. So I've got a couple of couple of quick items. Um, I want to let the board know that um, that we are the staff has been uh, um, and departments have been undergoing training this week uh, with virtual town hall uh, to make sure that that the um, uh, staff is is comfortable and and gets trained in how to update their pages, adding minutes, agendas, items, um, and uh, doing things like that. Uh, we're looking at a launch date. Uh, the week of November 16th, uh, and so that's what we've been moving towards. Uh, the page is coming together nicely, and uh, I just want to acknowledge um, the work that uh, Vanessa Hale, Brian Ballantyne, and uh, Michelle Jenkins have done in helping to pull this together. Um, it's, it's been very much appreciated. I um, uh, did want to uh, acknowledge um, the uh, ACIBIT uh, did their dedication on uh, Saturday, October 24th for their uh, completion of their renovation project at the ribbon cutting. And uh, just wanted to uh, give a thank you to Steve Therian uh, for his work on the project on behalf of Southboro. He was our representative. And um, uh, speaking earlier with uh, Mrs. Faniff, uh, he is glad that uh, that project is now behind him. Uh, it's been a lot of work, but uh, it, it, uh, it came out very nice. And, and so uh, thanks to Steve for his work on that. Uh, earlier um, this evening, at the beginning of the meeting, um, Mr. Rosimino, um acknowledged um, uh, the passing of, of one of our longtime employees, and um, I, um, I echo those comments, and I would like to just uh, say that um, I was very appreciative of all the uh, town employees, uh, town officials, uh, board and committee members uh, that came out um, to, the, uh, to the wake last week, um, came through um, together as a group. Um, and it was uh, very much appreciated. I know the family appreciated it very much. And um, in addition, uh, the town employees will be, uh, um, and boards and committee members, uh, will be making a donation to SMOC uh, on, uh, in Patrice's memory. Uh, so that was uh, something that, that, uh, that we felt that we wanted to do. Um, the Board of Assessors earlier this evening met and um, appointed uh, Cindy Beard uh, who is the uh, part-time person. She actually works a flex position. She works uh, for 16 hours in the assessor's office, 24 hours with the Board of Health, and she is going to be assuming uh, the full-time position in the assessor's office. Um, and uh, we will be advertising the board, the board of assessors. That is their appointment. They made that appointment earlier this evening. And uh, the, uh, the flex position uh, is going to be advertised uh, this week. So we'll be looking for candidates for that. Again, it's 16 hours uh, in the assessor's office, 24 in the Board of Health. It's a full-time position, benefited position. Um, so that will be, uh, that will be advertised. Um, the Route 9 water main project, uh, I spoke with Karen Galligan earlier. The main is complete on the westbound side between Pleasant and Central Street. Uh, the, Brook Line, the Brook Lane main has been tapped and uh, the contractor is moving west. Uh, on the eastbound side, they're gonna move to Oak Hill. Uh, relatively soon, then head east toward Brook Lane next week. Um, they should be out of the Mass DOT right away within the next two weeks, and then the pieces along the shoulder will be connected. Um, all of that should be completed this year um, before, uh, before the freeze, but we will be out of the Mass DOT right away, uh, right of way um, within the time frame that, um, that they require us to do so. And uh, finally, um, I, I did speak earlier with uh, Mark Robodeau and uh, did take a, take a ride today to verify myself. Um, uh, he has been working uh, with Mr. Aswad regarding the requirements of his Class II license and the improvements that were required as of um, uh, the end of October for his Class II license have been completed. The fence has been repaired, um, but the new fence is not due to go in per the uh, Class II license until uh, next May. So the paving has been done, the striping has been done, um, and now uh, the, uh, the building inspector um, will need to enforce, you know, make sure that the uh, requirements and the new spacing and everything is enforced at that location. That's all I have. So, um, you know, the circumstances obviously are, are not ideal, but the, uh, the backfilling of the assessor's position with somebody internal is something that uh, very glad to see could happen. 
Well, it, it, yeah, th thank you. It just, and, and like I said, credit to the Board of Assessors and to, and to uh, Mr. Sibeli. Um, you know, we, we like to have an opportunity to move people up and, and there aren't many opportunities in a small organization. And um, uh, Mrs. Beard has been, has been excellent in her role in that office. It takes a special person to be able to work in two different locations and split her day up that way and, and do both extremely well and be a good representative for the town in both locations. And, and I think she just felt that, you know, she would rather just be in the one location given the opportunity to do so. Great. All right, we'll move to public comment. Do we have something? Yes, Ms. Asselbeke. Desiree Asselbeke in 137 Woodland Road. I just want to um, comment and follow up with an email that I sent the board, Mr. Purple and Mr. Robidoux, regarding the Oswald property. I know that I, I, I have been a vocal um, participant in that discussion since the Class II license came up back um, in really, what was it? last year. <laughs> um, anyways, I, did, I have been monitoring the property. I will, I give a lot of credit to Mr. Robidoux as I did in my email to him um, regarding the follow-up on this property. It does look aesthetically a hundred times better than it has the past 30 years. And so for that as a neighbor and as somebody who drives by that property on a regular basis, almost daily. I appreciate that very much that the town has stepped up, particularly Mr. Robidoux, to take um, hold of that. What I do want to make the selectmen, um, the administrator, and the building inspector aware is that regardless of the striping, the improvements, the fences, and the aesthetics of the property, I am still deeply concerned about the safety issues in, their, in the parking situation on that parcel. I, am I correct that per the class two license, there is to be no parking around where the tanks used to be? Where the, where the gas, where the gas used to be, there is not supposed to be any parking of cars on either side of that I, I per believe, the license. I believe the striping speaks to the parking and nothing beyond that, so well, it, that would be the case. Well, then I would need some guidance for this board as to what I am supposed to do about the constant violation of that and if there can be any financial fines assessed to this man because it happens every single day. It continues to be horrific to, to look right in order to see if somebody going, you know, 50 miles an hour on 85 is gonna clip me to, lead, to go out of Woodland. So what is, your, um, what is your suggested remedy of how I go about um, pursuing this particular issue of improper parking at that space of the parcel? So, I think these are very good questions. And I think uh, I agree that if there are violent, and I know that they probably have to move vehicles in and out of the bay um, that are being worked. Um, maybe that's it's temporary. I doubt it. It's the okay. it's the registered so, dealer plate that's okay. parked there all the so, time. Um, if that is the case, and it and if it's all the time, um, you know, I, I would ask. You know, Mark can only be in one place at one time, but I would ask if he could make this as he has done, continue to make this a priority. But if if you would work with him and 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 ask that he. Um, try to make uh, more regular appearances there to and if there are violations they are dealt with immediately and the owner is instructed to immediately stop doing those and then I trust any additional violations if there are any not only could dramatically increase any fines that would be uh, appropriate but could cause a uh, suspension and, and or revocation hearing in front of this board is that correct and I, and I think these things, and these things Ms. Hesselbeacon has brought forward, um, you know, are, are valid. Um, and I think that Mr. Robido has, has asked that, you know, you just inform him when there are violations in that. He's been working with Mr. Aswad. He's very willing, you know, to, you know, to address these violations. So and are these, and these are going to be things that the board will, you know, have to consider, you know, when it comes time in less than a month to renew to look at renewing the licenses too as to you know again it's a limited <clears throat> period of time but 
what has happened with the license since they've had the class two. Would it be appropriate for Mr. Robito to send a notice um, uh, to the owner um, detailing where vehicles can be parked and cannot, and that what the violations could be in the event that you know he's misusing the the property as uh, as outlined. Well, you know, I mean, it, I would this recommend could be, no parking signs. Well, that too, right? I mean, uh, it, it minimally, you, if he himself hasn't seen it, right. we clearly have um, uh, you know narrative commentary from people who drive by all the time who have seen it. Um, he can't give a fine based on that, but he can clearly give guidance that if and when he sees it, here's what the fines are going to be. And by the way, don't, don't let me even get to that point. Right. Um, and, and, and another point is, is um, you know, again, our police officers are out there. Right? It's not their primary duty, but is it, is it something that they would have any jurisdiction over as well? No. No. Okay. No. It, so, it, it, it's, a, it's a zoning issue, um, and it's an issue of a license. Therefore, you know, one, because the license is in effect, and, and the conditions of the license are in effect, we have the ability to enforce those. Okay. So it, it would fall to Mr. Robito to enforce those. I strongly encourage him to uh, remind the owner of uh, his obligations, and and strongly encourage him to be there as often as he can especially with what we've heard tonight and not just tonight but many nights and um you know and if fines uh, you know need to be issued they need to be issued immediately and um that needs to be corrected and and the owner needs to be fully aware of it it's got to stop it's this has been going on too long it, so it it's that even Marquee. cleaner than that it was an understanding when the site design was brought before this board that there'd be no parking adjacent to those islands. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as putting a no parking sign out there. I mean, well, he, you're right. And then he, he, you know, the fear is the, the owner no says parking. that's for no one else to park, no. but I can do whatever yeah. I want on my property. He needs to be aware of what he, 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 he cannot do on the property. He understood clearly what was asked. Yeah. I bet you're right. So Thank you, Mr. Semino. Thank you. All right, uh, we'll move to the consent agenda. Uh, I'll, I'd like to entertain a motion if someone's willing to uh, take the numbers two through six um, uh, cumulatively. So I would move that we, if, if you'd like me to read them, I'd be happy to. In fact, I shall, if that's all right. That sounds good. So uh, to reappoint Kiera uh, Georgette to the Southboro Cultural Arts Council, term to expire October 22nd, 2017. Second. Uh, I'll do them all, and oh, if well. that's all right. If, if, maybe if I appoint Tracy Baldelli to the Southboro Cultural Arts Center, term to expire November 3rd, 2017. Appoint Lori Blanchard to the Southboro Cultural Arts Council, to ex uh, term to expire November 3rd, 2017. Appoint Christina Doberpool to the Southboro Cultural Arts Council, term to expire November 3rd, 2017. And finally, appoint David Candela to the Community Preservation Committee as Recreation Commission Representative, term to expire June 30, 2018. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Four zero. Um, how about a motion on item number one, Mr. Kalinda? Uh, well, I'm going to have to ask another to make oh, that right. one. I'm going to unfortunately have to abstain from one of those. I think so. I do too. So, Mr. Uh, Mrs. Fanna from Mr. Shea? I th well, I, I'll move to approve the minutes from May 5th, 2015 and October 20th, 2015. Second. Uh, all right, let's take them one at a time. Um, Tuesday, uh, May 5th, 2015, I'll make a motion that we approve them, recognizing that one board member is not sitting. And we have a quorum. And Mr. Rooney's not here this evening, so we can't approve them anyway. You can approve them. We can approve them. With who? We Mr. Boland's to. not here. Um, Mr. Rooney's not no, no, here. No, no, but, no. But I believe no, the, the board yes. can the, approve the, the, the minutes. The board can approve the minutes. Right. Are the, minutes. Yes. the minutes are the minutes of the board. So we have a quorum of the board here, including three voting members. Right. Otherwise, what's our you know, minutes will never get released and or never get approved, and the public doesn't know if those are. Well, I'm just I mean, saying, Mr. Shea was not think, sitting on the board either. Right, but I think we're approving that these right. are the minutes of the board. That I don't have a problem with them. I just 
question of process. Yeah, I, I, I don't have a problem with the contents of the minutes. Perhaps Mr. Shea could take notice of my and Mrs. Faniff's uh, uh, comfort in that regard. Um, <laughs> Uh, because we do, these are overdue, and, and to your point, Mr. Kalenda, it's, it's, uh, it's on us a little bit because yes. they're a little overdue, so uh, we won't have that again. We haven't had that in a long time. Agreed. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And one, one abstention, Mr. Kalenda, all right. And then with regard to October 20, any comment? None. Um, all right, then all in favor to approve the minutes of October 20 as presented. Aye. Aye. One abstention from me on that. All right. Finally, consent agenda item number seven, approval of selectman goals for fiscal year 2016. Um, do I have a motion? So I would move that we approve uh, the Board of Selectmen FY16 goals as presented in our packet. Second. Any discussion? Obviously, there was quite a bit of discussion last meeting, so. There was. Mr. Shea, anything? I have no comments. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 You got anything here, Mark? I don't have anything else. So. Okay. Um, all right, at this point, uh, the board will be entering. If, if I may, one alibi. Yes, sir. Um, so just to remind the public, so uh, on November 11th, is uh, Veterans Day. I believe the schools are off that day. Um, we will have a parade, as we always do, in the center of town at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. And I will be honored to march with my fellow veterans. And um, thank you for your service, uh, Mr. Uh, Cimino, as a veteran. I'll be there. Um, you'll be there. Um, and uh, so would love to see as much of the public out there as we can. I know we get a great um, uh, showing on Memorial Day. Would love to have uh, a larger and larger showing every year on Veterans Day. Unfortunately, sometimes that showing uh, seems to get a little smaller from time to time and would love to see the public come out. It's a very short uh, um, uh, parade and uh, at the All Wars Memorial that is beautifully ba maintained by the Fanta family and would love to see as many of our residents come out as they can. Mrs. Faniff and her husband both being veterans as well. That's, thank you. Hope to see you. Thank you, Mr. Kalenda. All right, at this point, the board will be entering into executive session per Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21, not returning to open session. Two issues to be discussed are first, the collective bargaining issue regarding the police union, which is exemption two to the open meeting law and the second is to consider the purchase of real property, which is exemption six. Uh, this requires a roll call vote. All in favor, Samino, aye. Belinda, aye. Shea, aye. We are in executive session. Thank you very much.